Hello everybody, Kevin Shortell here with Note School and Note School's Turnkey Flipping Academy. Great to have you on the uh, webinar here with us today and I've got a great case study for you. It's on a non-performing loan but it combines several dis different aspects of both real estate and real estate uh, financing. Hello everybody, Kevin Shortell here with Note School and Note School's Turnkey Flipping Academy. Welcome to the webinar, I've got a great one for you. It's a non-performing case study, non-performing loan more specifically, but it also comes by in several aspects of real estate as well. In today's world, we talk about this all the time, it's the, the most successful investors are going to be the ones who learn how to architect their way through a deal. And what we really interpret that as meaning is combining the best of the real estate world with the real estate financing world. And that's what the note business is all about. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera now and uh, we can go ahead and jump right into this case study. All right, this case study, courtesy of uh, one of our members, Tim Sieblink, uh, Tim did a great deal on this one uh, simply by weaving his way, navigating his way, if you will, through these strategies. There's going to be several takeaways that you'll get from this case study here. The first one's going to be that, yes, non-performing notes are still selling at deep discounts, especially in what we call the lower price band. And that's homes that are worth less than about $125,000. Those are still selling at deep discounts and create great opportunities for real estate investors and real estate note investors. The second takeaway is going to be that there are opportunities in vacant property. And unfortunately, a lot of properties that are vacant are starting to get lumped into this category of blighted property. There's a big difference between the two, and you'll see that in this case study as well. The importance of understanding the documents is the third takeaway. There have been times, and I've seen it over and over again, for people who are not properly trained, they don't have the knowledge basis to truly understand the documents, they have passed on good opportunities, and that will come to light in this case study as well. The importance of marketing and the sim simple methods of doing marketing that I think some people have gotten away from because of all the uh, availability of marketing through the internet and emails and everything else. And sometimes you got to go back to the basics. You'll see that as well. The fifth takeaway is going to be seller financing. And seller financing, especially once again in the lower price band assets, is critical today because bank financing is simply not as available as it once was in those lower price band assets. Seller financing is going to fill that void. And finally, being able to navigate your way through a deal and that will again encompass overcoming obstacles overcoming these little speed bumps through a deal and just knowing how to handle things that go through and I forgot one last one there uh, properties that sell for more properties will sell for more than BPO value no question about it we see it over and over and over again nothing against the real estate agents that are doing BPOs uh, at all I am a real estate broker myself but real estate agents real estate brokers are really in a way that they have to go through a certain process to do these BPOs and it doesn't include the real value that these properties can produce through the income approach and that is absolutely starting to change in this industry so let's dive into it and this is a typical middle class lower price band property in Youngstown Ohio there's a lot of inventory in the Midwest and in the Southeast that will look just like this this is almost becomes cookie cutter when you start to focus on where these best opportunities are this was a very simple two bedroom one bath 1300 square feet but the average rent in the area is five hundred dollars per month. Now I know I haven't given you a price on this asset yet, I'm just telling you it's in the lower price band, but I can assure you over and over again in the Midwest and the Southeast, you're going to run into properties where the rent is exceedingly higher than what the property value would indicate. And what I mean by that is we all use shortcuts in the real estate business, right? Uh, cap rates and all kinds of quick math, uh, dollars per square foot. I mean, there's all these little formulas that people use to kind of do a quick calculation to see if a deal's worth looking at any further. In the rental part of real estate, that typically comes down to what they call the 1% or maybe 2% rule. And that is for an investor to be interested in a property, 
it would have to produce rent that is 1% of the value. So in other words, if this property was valued at $50,000 and it rents for 1% of that per month or $500 a month, that is something that is of interest to investors. If this house was worth $100,000 and it only rents for $500 a month, well now you're looking at half of that and an investor would pass on that. And I assure you what you will find, and especially in this case study as well, that there are a lot of undervalued properties because they only look at this comparable sales approach. And investors today are looking at the comparable sales certainly, but more importantly, they're also considering how much income can this property produce and that's the income approach to valuation. So we've got a lower price band property here and Tim who bought this property uh, it started with the note first. That's how we, he acquired the property. Now, initially, his game plan, by the way, was not to acquire the property. Initially, this looked like what we call a loan modification. You buy a non-performing loan, and then you try to work with the borrower to do some kind of modification to take it from a non-performing note and get it into a re-performing note. Much like renovating a house, you add value to a note when you do that, right? When you buy a house and you fix it up, you're estimating what's it going to cost me to fix it up and what's it going to be worth after I fix it up, right? That's called the after repaired value. So certainly when you renovate a house, you fix a problem and that enhances the value. In the note business, you're buying a non-performing note in this case and his goal was to get that note re-performing. In other words, fix it. And we can step in and do a lot of things that banks simply aren't willing to do, right? Banks don't have the personnel, they don't have the patience, they don't have the time. So quite frankly, all these loans go in a big portfolio that, well, it's like a pixel on the screen that you're looking at. You know, if one goes bad, it, it just doesn't get the attention. When you buy that note, you can certainly turn that around. Now, without even knowing the value of what this property is according to the BPO, because it's not really important at this point in time, he bought this non-performing loan for $2,503. That was for the non-performing loan. Now, as a part of doing his due diligence, he also saw before he purchased the asset that there were property taxes passed due in the amount of $2,364. Now, that's an identifiable problem, right? We can look that up in our due diligence uh, folders. We have that in our Notes Direct program. You could also get on public records and find out that information. So he was fully aware that not only was he going to have the cost of purchasing the asset, in this case the non-performing loan, but also he had a cost to cure of $2,364. Now, I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't, that everybody on this webinar understands that property taxes are considered super liens in every state in the United States. And what that means is that property tax lien jumps to the front of the lien line, and property taxes uh, can cause a foreclosure on the property, and that foreclosure can wipe out the note holder as well as the property owner. Now, Tim, once again, being fully aware of this, knew that, you know what, $2,500 for the note, another $2,300, I'm in this thing for less than $5,000, and if I can get it reworking again, I can create a nice income stream for myself. So obviously, this was in what we call his risk tolerance here, because ultimately, if he can't get the loan working again through modification, he will end up acquiring the property. Now, we can acquire the properties either through a forced action, like a foreclosure, or a voluntary action, like a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So, after he purchased this asset, and he did purchase this one from Colonial. Colonial is our uh, note investment company, so uh, Colonial Capital Management is where he purchased this. And uh, we sent him, about a week or two later, a notification. Now, initially, this notification, quite frankly, uh, <laughs> uh, scared Tim a little bit because it was a decree of foreclosure. And I've taken just a portion of that actual decree here and put it on this slide for you. But you can see, and I've got it underlined there, that, that the county, for non-payment of real estate taxes, has gone ahead and authorized the foreclosure of this property. Now, that's a concern. You have to have this cured. In fact, when he further went into the decree of foreclosure, 
he came upon, of course, this statement, which is, wherefore it is ordered and adjudged and decreed that the plaintiff is granted a judgment of foreclosure and decreed that an order of sale shall be issued. And indeed, the sale was issued. Now, many people would have seen that and after the initial reaction, which even Tim had, Tim's a pretty seasoned guy, but his initial reaction was like, oh man, does that mean the property sold and I'm wiped out? Well, this is where, again, a seasoned investor who's got some experience, who's got a knowledge base, knows we've got to look further. What does that exactly mean and are there any rights that remain? Well, in Ohio, what happens is that there is a redemption period. So even though this property technically was sold at a foreclosure, the deed will not change hands until a redemption period of one year expires. So even though the sale was there, he had one year. So there you go. He was like, okay, so this is curable. I can pay those property taxes and then I have redeemed this property, meaning that the foreclosure a uh, process of, of switching the deed over is not going to occur. That's what a redemption period is all about. So again, this is one of your takeaways here. In the real estate business, as an investor myself, I've seen it happen over and over again where people sit down at a closing and they sign document after document after document after document. They have no idea what they're signing. They have a general idea because typically at a closing, the title company is saying, well, that's the insurance form. That's so we didn't coerce you into getting certain insurance. And this form is for that. And this form is for that. They give you like the, the highlight of what those forms are. In the paper business, we have to understand those documents because that's what we're buying. That's what the paper business is all about. We're buying these uh, uh, assets, these performing and not, in this case, non-performing notes, but those notes are secured by the property themselves. So we have to understand what is that security mechanism? What is our repercussions for items such as this? So although Tim's knee-jerk reaction was, oh boy, did I make a mistake and am I wiped out here? He knew enough to take it a step further, read through it, understand it, ask for help and find out, yes, there's one year redemption or I can make this go away. So he made it go away by how? Simply paying the property taxes. Now, does that mean he owns the tax liens and all that sort of stuff? No, he just paid the property taxes on the property. Could he get reimbursed for that as a part of the loan modification? Sure, that can be worked into a deal. Because remember, his goal was to end up getting this non-performing note, clearing the title, which is what he did here through uh, this redemption process, and then reworking the loan so that the property owner can stay in the property and afford it. Now, when he bought this, there was a question of, is the property owner still in the property or not? And sometimes you don't know, even though a real estate agent went out there and did a BPO. And once again, that's a part of the due diligence file. We have all of those in Notes Direct where, where our, our people, buy, where people buy notes from. And in that process, he saw that an agent went out there and the agent indicated that it was owner-occupied. Well, how do they know that? When agents do a BPO on these type of properties, they do a drive-by. I mean, you will literally see pictures of side view mirrors uh, or the agents in, the, in their car in the street taking pictures. I mean, that's all they're required to do is drive by and take at least three pictures. So they look for visual evidence. And the visual evidence is, is the lawn being maintained? Are there curtains in the windows? Uh, those sorts of items. Is there a car in the driveway? That sort of stuff. And if it is, it appears to them that it's owner-occupied, they will check that box. But again, that's not always the case. In fact, that's what happened on this one. So the story behind this, what we also call the flavor in the note business, the flavor of this deal. And in the note business, by the way, there's always the numbers, right? Do the numbers work? Do the numbers make sense on an investment level? But also there's human beings behind every one of these. So what's the story? What's going on? So here's the flavor of the, of the deal as it rolled out. The owner had left the property. Okay, even though the BPO indicated it was owner occupied, it was vacant. Now, for some of you going, oh man, is that going to be a problem in the future? No, remember, Tim was prepared either way. 
His initial exit strategy is, I'm going to get this loan, I'm going to go ahead and modify this loan, and the person will stay in the property and continue now to make payments that they can afford. So maybe that's adjusting the payment, maybe it's forgiving an arrearage account or moving an arrearage account to the back of the loan, some kind of modification. But he didn't buy it just based upon that because you never know. We have to default back to worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is that he would have to foreclose. Now, if he's only in this thing for $5,000, I know I haven't given you the price of what this asset was according to the BPO yet, but it's in that lower price band, uh, where's his risk, right? If he takes it back for the $5,000, I'm sure just in looking at those pictures as you did in the beginning, we could sell this property for a lot more than $5,000 and Tim would be fine. So Tim contacted the borrower. The borrower had moved out, he did a, um, trace and track down the, the people. Of course, he outsourced uh, that to a company. They located him. And once the communication opened up between this delinquent borrower and Tim, our note holder, the borrower wanted to move back in. All right, that's kind of a, a rarity. Sometimes when people move out of a property like that, they haven't made a mortgage payment in a long time, several years in most cases, they've kind of closed that chapter in their life. You know, they're, they're, they're done with that. They're moving on and uh, they're not going to move back into a property. But this borrower indicated, yeah, if you'll work with me, I will absolutely move back into the property and I will start making payments again. The borrower gave his cell phone number and um, I said, give me a call and let's talk through it. Well, the cell phone number ended up not working. So again, Tim sent out a uh, door knocker to the place and they told him that the borrower had moved again. So the borrower basically disappeared. All right, so Tim now is going, I can't find the borrower anymore. They look like they were going to be cooperative, but something's changed here. They're gone. And uh, after trying to track the person down, once again, having a skip trace company do some searching, they found out, well, this guy disappeared for a, a, a reason. <laughs> in fact, he was in jail. So we now have a delinquent borrower who is in jail and he was in jail for drugs. Well, does that kill a deal? Of course not. Once again, if Tim has to take this property back, does he need the permission of the borrower to foreclose? And of course the answer is no. We don't need a borrower's permission to foreclose. The borrower has to be delinquent. We have to show that they are delinquent, uh, but therefore we can foreclose uh, without that. Could this person be in jail and we have a, a notary go to the jail and have them sign a, a deed in lieu? Absolutely, that could happen, and it has. Uh, so this doesn't kill a deal. Again, this is part of navigating your way through. There are certain things that we can control and recognize in investing, but there are other things that we cannot. And that's the same for the stock market and, and, and real estate and, and everything else, really. So we go with a known amount of risk, but we always have that what if and how do we navigate our way through this. So some people may have given up at this point in time and just said there's, there's nothing here. I've got to wait until this person gets out of the jail. No, nope, not the case. And you know what? Not even the case when it comes down to securing the property. Tim, who owns the note, okay, so Tim is the bank, if you will, Tim can absolutely secure that property absolutely secure that property because it is a secured interest in that property. So just because the person's in jail doesn't mean that Tim can't move forward on a vacant property to secure it. So he hired a company to go out there and secure it and uh, it turns out when the property was up there securing it and changing the lock on the front door and those sorts of things, well they got a little visit and the visit was from the police. And the police told the property preservation company, you can't go in there. We have a do not enter uh, notification on this property. You have to leave immediately. All right. Once again, you're like, uh-oh, what happens here? And what do smart investors do? They figure out the problem. Problems have solutions. Solutions cost time and money. Now, initially, you're probably thinking, oh, I bet I know what the police order was. Because Tim was thinking the same thing. Okay, let's let's go through the math here. This person uh, uh, disappeared on us. They went to jail because of drugs. Does that mean I have a vacant home here that uh, 
had meth or something in it. You know, is this a is this a a, a chemical lab in there, something like that. And so again, our brains sometimes go to worst case scenario. Well, what he found out was the borrower had initially moved back into the property but didn't turn all the utilities on. Well, in that particular county, they have a law that says you cannot live in a property without having all the property utilities on. So this person wasn't paying the bill and uh, I think he was actually trying to steal power from uh, next door and such as well. But uh, what happened was the utility company went out there and they actually cut the lines to the utilities to the property and therefore the property could not be occupied under their local ordinance. The utility company also slapped a lien on the property in the amount of $1,187. Okay, problem is it? curable. It is. Okay? It is curable. Quite frankly, sometimes you can search public records, and some investors do, to see if there are these other utility liens on, on properties. And I'm not sure, quite frankly, that in, in the write-up that Tim gave me, I don't know if he looked at that first. I don't think he did, because I know in his story he said he was very surprised uh, with the do not enter. It was assuming the worst, and it turned out just to be $1,100 for a utility lien. So that's curable for how much? Well, 1187. So Tim went ahead and paid that on the property. Now, he doesn't own the property yet, but he's making the problems go away. He has a vested in the interest in the property and ultimately now his initial plan of a modification, that's not going to happen. Right? This person is not going to be qualified. This is not the kind of person that you want to do any kind of load modification with. So now he's back to that default position of, hey, I can take this property back and I can rent it for $500 a month and I only have $6,000 some odd dollars in it at this point in time. Yeah, I'm going to have some, some rehab in there. So maybe another uh, $8,000. So I'm in it for $14,000, $15,000 and I can rent it for $500 a month. Where's the problem with that? Or could he turn around and just sell the property as is, right? So he's got plenty of options. And that's one of the things I love about the note business is that we do have options. We have multiple outs. In fact, when you're thinking about buying these, you're always thinking, okay, how am I getting in? How am I getting out? And what are my multiple exit strategies upon getting out? So Tim was in no problem here at all. He just had to shift strategies for making this re-performing to go ahead and acquiring the property, and then he could do what? Sell it as is, fix it up and sell it, uh, or put a tenant in it, sell it as a loaded uh, rental property, sell it to a consumer with seller financing. He had many, many options, all of which he's going to make money on. It's just a matter of how much and when. Now, Tim does a high, high volume of, of the note business, and for him, this was kind of a smaller deal. So he, uh, admittingly, in, in the write-up that he gave me for this, he said, you know what, I kind of let this one go a little bit longer than I should have, simply because I didn't have that much money in it. But he ended up getting the deed to the property through a deed in lieu. And you can see by the picture there, he had a company come out, put a dumpster out there. Uh, the dumpster people happened to know a company that would come out and cut the lawn as well. Very inexpensive and because Tim kind of put this on the back burner, Tim does travel quite a bit. He said, you know what, I'm going to go out there and, and see what uh, uh, see where we are in this whole thing. So Tim went out there on the property actually and was cleaning out. He was uh, just unloading. The house was not damaged inside. Uh, so when the person left, they didn't um, do any damage to the property. They left some furniture and they left some personal items and those sorts of things, which Tim really just bagged up himself and was thrown in the dumpster. Now, of course, could Tim have outsourced that to another company to do all that sort of stuff? Of course. In this case, it was convenient for him to go out there and take a look. So now he's in this property at about $8,100. So that's his all in, but it still has work to do. Needs a new roof. Needs a new roof. While he was out there, cleaning out the property with the dumpster. He went ahead and also purchased a for sale by owner sign and on the for sale by owner sign he offered seller financing. Seller financing attracts more people than just for sale, right? Because especially once again in this lower price band it's very very difficult if not impossible to get a bank loan on some of these houses. Why? Well, Legislation, 
Okay, Dodd-Frank limits how much money a bank can make to originate a loan on these properties. And in many cases, when you start getting into properties that are less than $60,000, a bank can't make any money on the loan because of the cost of creating the loan. That's a problem. Okay, solution, seller financing. When you offer attractive terms, now it opens up to a lot more potential buyers, and that's exactly what happened. Now, I mentioned the sign, and I'm going to emphasize this a little bit more, because it takes me back in my mind to a couple of years ago, I was sitting down at one of our uh, uh, annual events. We have a uh, summer summit every summer, and as a part of the summer summit, all the people that are there can, if they want to, sit down one-on-one -on -one, uh, with myself and several other of our instructors and, and coaches. And I was sitting down uh, with a group of people at lunch and I had a gentleman that said, you know, I've, I've got this property, I took it back and it's just not selling. You know, I'm, I'm advertising it on, on Craigslist, I, I put a website together on it and I've sent some emails out to local investors and I'm just not getting anywhere with it. And uh, I said, well, okay. And I kind of knew what the answer was going to be, but I set it up this way and I said, okay, well, how many people have called on the sign in the yard? You have a property that's on a quarter, much like this property. I said, you, should, you have signs on the yard. How many people have called on that? And I could tell immediately, you know, by his face, he's like, wow. I don't have any signs on the property. I just got so caught up and trying to market electronically and everything else, I forgot one of the most simple and basic things, which is putting a sign in the yard. There's people driving by this house every single day, investors, consumers, they don't know what's going on on this property and they're dying to find out. And you know what? That's exactly what happened to Tim. As he was cleaning up, he said it was about three o'clock. He was waiting for the utility company to come out and hook up the utilities. A car pulls over and started asking a question about the seller financing. Then he told him, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to sell the property for $49,000. I'll take uh, $2,500 down and finance the rest to a qualified buyer by the way okay so these folks were intrigued by that and they said well we're very interested so Tim proceeded to lay out here's what we're gonna need I, I gotta see some pay stubs I gotta see some bank statements tax forms look when you're doing a loan with somebody you wanna do it to somebody who's qualified you don't want somebody who's not gonna end up making payments so you don't do any of these what Eddie Speed calls a wink and nod mod you know you don't do that you wanna make sure these people are qualified and you have loan officers that can do all those sorts of things from you. you don't have to be in the same town the same state uh, or any of that sort of stuff there are lenders everywhere that can qualify people even for seller finance loans and you can outsource all that stuff so Tim knows what's needed and he just kind of gave them an outline and you know what the people went ahead got all the information back they came back at a pretty good uh, debt to income ratio where they could afford uh, the property so he sold the property for forty nine thousand dollars now if you recall I mentioned that there was going to be $2,500 down. But the problem was, excuse me, the problem was that these borrowers had to put a new roof on. Okay, As he was conversing with these folks, they found out that, uh, well, this guy works for a contractor. So he can put a roof on himself. And obviously, if he can do it himself, he can do it cheaper because he won't have the labor cost on that, just the parts. So in this case, Tim agreed and he said, all right, We'll stick with the sales price at $49,000, but you don't have to put anything down. Do we always do nothing down deals? Of course not. But this was different circumstances because Tim was happy. He was like, hey, I can sell it and sell it right now. I start getting payments next month, and I don't even have to put a roof on it. Right? This person's going to put the roof on the property or fix the roof or patch it or whatever they needed to do. So in that case, he decided, I won't take anything, uh, anything down. All right. So now Tim has a performing note. He sold the house for $49,000. Now you'll see the interest rate was at 9%. Is 9% higher than bank rates? Of course. These folks can't get bank rates. They don't qualify. Banks aren't offering, so it's going to be a higher interest rate than bank rates, and for seller financing, 9%, pretty common. 
Okay, pretty common interest rate in seller financing to consumers. They set up a 30-year loan, so these folks have monthly payments of $394.27. Those monthly payments go to who? Well, of course, to Tim. Okay, so Tim took a non-performing note. He tried to get it re-performing. That didn't work out. He acquired the property cleaned out the property, sold the property with seller financing, so now he owns a note. He's got $8,110 out of pocket and he's receiving $400 per month. You can kind of do the, <laughs> the quick math on that one, right? I mean, how many of you would like to trade $8,000 for $400 a month for 30 years? Because you know what's going to happen? These folks aren't going to be in that property for 30 years. What are they going to do? They're going to sell the house or they're going to refinance the property somewhere down the road, which means there's going to be a payoff at some point in time. And on top of that, we all know that these loans are amortized, meaning most of their monthly payment, especially in the first half of the loan, are going to be going towards interest, very little principal reduction. So he would have a huge payout, probably around $47,000 if they refinance this thing or sold the property in five years. Okay. And you can run and do the quick math on that, but I'm sure it's probably somewhere uh, going to be around forty-six, forty-seven thousand dollars in which to do that. Now, how did he come up with the price of the forty-nine thousand dollars, especially when the BPO said it's only worth sixteen thousand dollars? BPO broker's price opinion says this property was only worth sixteen thousand dollars. That's a problem. Okay. It's not the real estate agent's fault. I'm not saying they did a poor job on that at all. The real estate agent who did this BPO had to use the comparable sales that were available through the multiple listing service in that area. And he looked for properties in that area that had sold recently that were the same two bedroom, one bath, about the same square footage, about the same construction, all those sorts of things that came up with a value of $16,000. Now, what's not taken into consideration is those were and typically are going to be distressed sales still, cash sales. And you know what? Not all of the sales go through multiple listing service as well. This property was worth a lot more. What a lot of people are looking at, what can I buy this for? What can I afford in the form of monthly payments? That's where seller financing comes in. That's how he was able to change this deal. Now, you might be sitting at home going, I don't, I don't know, $16,000, that was before repairs on the property, right? Because they don't, they don't know what condition the property is. All right, so maybe a, a BPO, if you add in repairs, maybe it's worth $20,000. Again, you're going to find these artificially low numbers, especially in the Midwest and the Southeast. That's where the best opportunities in all of real estate and all of real estate notes are today because of this market condition. And that's what it is. It's a market inefficiency here that you, understanding this, are going to be able to profit from because the fact of the matter is this house was worth a lot more than what they could show in a BPO. Okay? These folks now are homeowners. They got in for nothing down. They put in some sweat equity, right? They had to go up there and fix the roof on their dime, paying for the materials, put in the labor, and now they're making payments that they can afford. And you know what? Did Tim get any uh, um, backlash from 9%? No. No, not at all. Why? Because the bottom line is circled in red there. What people look at is what can I afford? Okay, what can I afford on a monthly basis? And that's what Tim did on this deal. So again, your takeaways are non-performing notes. Are they still selling at deep discounts? Yes, they are, especially in the lower price band. Okay, what we're seeing today is notes are selling at about anywhere and again, in the lower price band, anywhere from 20 to 50 or 55 percent investment to value ratio. Okay, investment to value ratio means your investment, your cost of the note, as it relates to the value of the property. Okay, so if you're going to the courthouse, for example, and you're buying foreclosed property at the courthouse steps, and you're seeing people pay 80, 85 percent 
of what the property is worth, that's an 80-85% investment to value ratios. So with notes, if you're getting it for 50% or less, you're getting a deep, deep discount. And a lot of real estate investors have finally figured this out to the point, that's why they're coming to our live classes and, and everything else and coming out to see us and learn more about this because they recognize that they can acquire real estate cheaper by acquiring the note first especially on vacant properties, right? Because you're going to end up on a vacant property, there's a high, high, high probability. You're going to end up with that property. It's just a matter is, are you going to get it through a foreclosure or are you going to get that through a deed in lieu? So are the opportunities still there? Yes. There's no need for you to overpay at the foreclosure sales. I would assume everybody on this call knows that uh, Short sales are pretty much all, all but done. Uh, property values are, are going up and people are paying way too much for even fixer-uppers today. Wholesalers are, are having trouble trying to make margin because they can't um, create enough of a spread because investors are dealing, who are not buying notes first, they're dealing with, in most areas, razor-thin margins and one mistake could put them into uh, the wrong the wrong category where they're losing money so not performing you know, notes yes still selling at a deep discount are there opportunities in vacant property yes I just wrote an article as a matter of fact if you're on our social media we have Facebook we have Twitter we do articles uh, really on a, a just about a weekly basis and I did one recently talking about blighted property versus vacant property and I would encourage you to take a look at that through Facebook or through uh, at Note School, uh, through Twitter, and learn about those because too many people now are starting to lump vacant property in with blighted property. Big difference. Okay, blighted property, uninhabitable, tear down, that sort of thing. Vacant property, whole different ball game. So it's important that you learn the difference between that. Tim saw that in this one. He had an idea. This may be vacant. It looks like it might still be owner occupied. But once again, his default position was: worst case, I can't get this loan modified. I'm just going to take the property back and I'm going to sell it. And I'll sell it with seller financing. And he converted an $8,000 all-in investment to uh, 300 some odd dollars per month. Well, it was almost $400 uh, per month. Okay. Understanding the documents, I've seen plenty of cases over the years where people don't know enough about the documents. They haven't taken a deep dive into the documents. They'll they'll read a you know a paragraph or a headline. And if they see something like in this case study a decree of foreclosure and they see the property's been uh, been sold or scheduled for sale, they panic and they pass on opportunities where a deeper understanding, a deeper dive into the documentation, whether you can do that yourself or use the the, the help of experts, he walked away from this going, I, I got a cure here. It's no problem. The cure is going to cost me about eleven hundred bucks. I'm just going to go down and or in the, I'm sorry, in that case the uh, twenty three hundred dollars for the um, uh, for the taxes. No, no problem. Let's get that that done. And he knew about the taxes really ahead of time. Didn't see the decree of foreclosure yet <laughs> because that wasn't a part of public records yet. He received that after he bought. But again, not a problem. Take a deeper dive. Understand that. And you know what, Craig, quite frankly, when, when we teach this and you're thinking of investing in other states, we always encourage people, learn about that state ahead of time. Learn about these redemption periods and everything else, and that way, I create spreadsheets, for example, for myself. In every state that I invest in, I have all these things that I can look at and say, oh yeah, that has a redemption period, it's one year, uh, they do have utility liens, here's where they, you know, so you start to put these things out so that when you do get these documents, you will have an advantage over people who simply don't have the knowledge base to understand the documents. Marketing, marketing, marketing. Marketing is what this selling property is, is, is all about. So you want to market, yes, use all of the great things that we can do through technology today, but don't lose out on just the simple things such as signs. Okay, He, he went and stopped by a Lowe's uh, when he was going to go uh, clean out the property, and that was one of the first things he did when he got there. Park some signs out there. That paid off uh, later that day at three o'clock when a car pulled over and said we're interested. Guess what? Those people have been driving by that house all the time going, I wonder what's going on. I wonder what's going on. And he put it out there. Okay. So marketing is the key. Now we also, and Tim could have did, done this as well, didn't have to in this case, but there are lead lists that you can acquire. 
of real estate investors who buy properties in virtually every county, virtually every county across the United States. You can buy a lead list and you can directly market those folks. In the Midwest and the Southeast, investors from California, from New York, they all are going to those markets and investing in properties, rental properties and everything else. They're looking for good deals. They're looking for seller financing. So if Tim didn't sell this simply by the drive-by, which happened in this case, he would have got a lead list which would have targeted specific people in that area who have already purchased properties, but they don't even live in the state. That's strong and smart marketing in today's world, access to information. Seller financing was the key on this one. If he just put for sale, there's no way that car would have stopped in my mind. I just don't believe that to be the case. What attracted those people to this property was seller financing because then they said, all right, we don't have to go to a bank. Okay, It looks like the property needs a little bit of work. Well, heck, I work for a contractor. I can do that work myself. I'm willing to put in sweat equity if this person will set up attractive terms for us. In fact, I'm willing to pay market or higher than market price if I can get attractive terms. That's the thought process that these people went through who pulled over the car to talk with Tim about buying it. It was the seller financing that drew them in, not simply the fact that the property was for sale. They've already tried to get financing. This probably would happen as well, or in their mind, they didn't have the credit or the debt to income ratio that they could even walk into a bank. Seller financing, once again, fills that void, and it is key. Be able to navigate through a deal. You're going to have zigs and zags from time to time in these investment deals. It's very untypical for it to be a straight line, although that can happen where you go from point A to point B and you're, and you're good to go. Many times you're going to have to navigate your way through the deal, just like Tim did in this one. You know, the initial thing, do a modification, person was willing to do that, now they're in jail, now we have to go a different method, we got the deed in lieu, took the property back, now what are we going to do? Sell it with seller financing, we got to rent it, what are we going to do? He marketed it and obviously it paid out very, very well for him. And you also saw how properties sell for more than BPO value. BPO values end up today being really uh, in, in these specific target markets, these, these BPOs are artificially low and we see it over and over and over again and once again I'm not blaming a real estate agent the real estate agent had no choice but to put that value on the property based upon the comparable sales they saw in multiple listing service what you need to do as a smart investor is understand first of all that whole concept and what they're looking at and then you look at the market as an investor through investor eyes right there's a different type of valuation model when you're looking as a consumer to buy a property versus an investor to buy a property. As they always say, value is in the eye of the uh, beholder. So we make our money with the difference between price is what you pay, value is what you get. We navigate our way through these deals and with the deep discounts that we're still able to acquire real estate by purchasing the non-performing notes creates an opportunity unlike anything else out there in real estate today. So hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, once again, Kevin Shortell with Note School. I'm uh, one of the national instructors. So if you're coming out to see us at a live event, I will see you there. We have a calendar on, on our website, noteschool.com, that you can find out where we're going to be. And uh, we'll have another informative webinar for you uh, once again. Thank you, everybody.